All right, um, so this research takes place on the unceded territory of the Seal uh, people of the Okanagan Nation. Um, they have resided and cared for this land in a sustainable manner for many thousands of years. Digital archives are a valuable resource for documenting and retrieving different forms of media, such as images, audio, text, and mapping data. These archives are used widely by researchers and users to retrieve information about a given topic. While the simple index of common databases provides valuable accessibility to the vast amounts of information of databases, there has been very little research exploring the representation of non-objective criteria, such as subjective experiences or responses. Much work has already been done in the field of Western sciences on documenting and digitally cataloging flora and fauna. Entries created by naturalists allow users to read about a species' common name, Latin binomial name, migration and distribution patterns, and so forth. However, it is notable that the observer is missing from the entry. Of course, this is done intentionally to present a description that is as systematic, non-biased, and neutral as possible. But herein also lies an issue. In Wampum, Sequoian, and Story, Decolonizing the Digital Archive, Cushman problematizes archives of indigenous artifacts which elevate the Western tradition through a process of othering primitive and native traditions. Through institutions such as archives and museums, Western knowledge is enunciated, that is, brought into being, codified, legitimatized, and reproduced as knowledge. Continuing to work in this method of ar archiving acknowledges and secures Western knowledge systems that are characteristic of colonial characteristic of the colonial anthropologist, discrediting non-Western ways of knowing as something less than knowledge. Cushman identifies actions involved in damaging artifacts through collection, including that the, the item is taken from its context of use and that it is no longer understood in relation to the stories that place the item in its context and in relation to the people who use it. In the Seal language, flora and fauna is to milk which translates to all living things. And to be sealed means to be spun into a fiber of one interconnected and unified strand with every other being. When a life form from the Okanagan region is portrayed in a detached and dispassionate manner, by diverse and significant human perceptions, interactions, and engagements with nature are lost. The aim of my broader research is to create and evaluate a sample digital archive of the local flora and fauna of the Okanagan region. The unique approach of this archive is in representing species through artistic responses, experiential interpretations, and creative forms of storytelling that seek to lift some of the limitations of traditional archives in order to permit the documentation of alternative ways of knowing. In this presentation, I ask, what does a framework for an archive representing local life forms expressing ourselves, our identities, and our nature, relationships to nature look like? The documentation and digital archiving of flora and fauna is not in and of itself problematic. According to L.T. Smith in Decolonizing Methodologies, the notion of decolonizing does not mean and has not meant a total rejection of all theory or research or Western knowledge. Rather, it is about centering our concerns and worldviews and then coming to know and understand theory and research from our own perspectives and for our own purposes. Alexandrina Agloro, in a forum Decolonizing the Digital by Cardenas et al., interprets this as an opportunity to remix and repurpose digital tools rather than rejecting them for their colonial origins. In Becoming Storyteller, Making Meaning of Our Age of Resistance, Wazia Talan writes about her responsibility to tell her grandmother's stories to ensure that the Dakota Indigenous identity and culture distorted by colonization does not become forgotten. She writes that the storytelling method is a powerful counter to colonial myths, an active agent of decolonization. She describes creative expression as an alternative method of storytelling and as a method of sharing knowledge. Cree scholar Sean Wilson writes in his book, Researcher's Ceremony, that knowledge itself is held in the relationships and connections formed with the environment that surrounds us. Therefore, it is important to consider how our representations of nature speak, and speak to and form not only our relationships to the land around us, but also to our self-identity as a being who is a part of this land. In order to compile this archive, however, 
it is first necessary to articulate how the archive content is produced. Developing a framework is critical to ensure the archive is created responsibly in a manner that is respectful to the land. A pilot project workshop held at the University of British Columbia Okanagan focused on the ponderosa pine and participants responded to this local species using visual art, personal experiences and storytelling to investigate the species. I utilized participant observation and hermeneutic phenomenology. The examination, interpretation, and reflection of lived experiences gives rise to insights on potential guidelines around generating creative content for an archive on local flora and fauna. The participants were asked to introduce themselves, their backgrounds, and heritages to those present. This is a Seelk tradition of practicing relationality. A discussion around memories, knowledge, and experiences relating to Ponderosa Pine was led to stimulate creative thinking around the species. Pine needles, pine cones, and shed bark were passed around during this discussion. Participants spent the following two hours working on their creative responses and then wrote brief artist statements to accompany their work. Participant A's response was inspired by childhood memories around playing pretend using various components of the tree. The process of playing with the pine cones, needles, etc., and the resulting incomplete work shown here brings attention to the tree's tactile qualities. Participant B was interested in the form of the pine cone. The bottom of the cone was painted and printed like a stamp, and the philotaxis arrangement is isolated and emphasized in the print. Participant C's work describes the energy transfer between the urban areas of Kelowna and the ponderosa pine forests. These two very different dynamics are shown here as being intertwined to create an overall environment. Participant D was interested in the idea of painting with a pine needle brush, paying particular attention to the contact between the paper and the pine needles, and how the pressure created an interesting relationship between the paper, the, ink, the material of the brush, and the artist. The participant writes here, I think this image reminds me of the bark of the tree. Participant E relates the shed bark pieces of the ponderosa pine to a topographic map. To this participant, the gold thread represents the richness of the Okanagan landscape as experienced when driving. Participant F writes, my father and I went camping one time and slept on a bed of ponderosa pine. Using paper and two bundles of pine needles, a representational piece is created. Participant G titled his piece, Beneath the Forest Floor, writing, parallel lines emulate the feeling of forgotten pine needles left to rot alongside, alongside pine cones that have fallen as well. This image, like participant D's, is painted with pine needles. Participant H writes, my relationship with ponderosa pine is through birds. For local bird species, the ponderosa is a world to them. Home, territory, feeding spot, resting place, and storage. Based on reflections and insights that are omitted from this presentation due to time constraints, the following guidelines create the framework thus far. One, the contest content must be created locally and be in response to life forms from the region. Two, any part of the life form or all of the life form may be represented. Three, the sensory experiential response to the species can be in the form of recollections, memories, observations, and expressed through any creative medium. Four, the content must represent or address the species in question as directly as possible. Five, the entry will include the documentation of the work, which may comprise of, if applicable, a video, a photograph, or text documenting the final work and or of the progress of the work, as well as the title of the work, medium, dimensions, artist statement, and reflection on the artist's background and historicality as conscious or subconscious contributors to the product. Six, the creative content must acknowledge or be respectful of the seal of territory. Practice respect, relationality, and reciprocity wherever possible. Seven, life forms that change or transform over the seasons may be represented as it is experienced over the seasons, perhaps through multiple documentations. 
This framework will continue to change and develop as this practice-based research continues. Guidelines on which archive content is produced and selected emerged by means of engaging in a workshop followed by reflection on lived experience. The resulting insights may be significant not only to the Okanagan flora and fauna archive that I intend to develop, but to any digital archive that seeks to gather content that does not conform to conventional Western notions of knowledge. This research addresses the value of representing and documenting non-objective criteria such as subjectivity, cultural, experiential, and interpretive knowledge. Thank you.